We talked about the first two days of the NFL draft, so we might as well wrap it up and talk about day three. Obviously, it goes without being said, the longer the draft goes on, the less intriguing it gets. All the notable, intriguing, and the fan favorite players, they get selected in the first or second round. There is some notable guys later on in the draft, but it's not as much. For the most part, a lot of the guys that get selected in the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th round, it's many people you never heard of. It's so funny though because we'll look back on this draft in 3, 4, 5 years and we'll point to a guy that got selected in the 5th or 6th round and say, hey, how did we not know he was going to be the star he is today? That's what makes it so cool because you know there's going to be some diamonds in the rough, you just don't know which ones are going to be. To go along with that, you also realize there's going to be a lot of busts that got selected in the first round. The hardest part and the biggest dilemma these teams face and even fans you don't know who the busts are going to be we can predict it and you may have a good idea but only time will tell i'm not calling baker mayfield a bust but imagine if i would have told you after he got selected number one only three to four years later he doesn't even have a job that's a completely different conversation for a different day but that is so and I mean so fascinating what's currently going on with him. It almost seems that for Baker Mayfield, and I think he's good enough to be a starting quarterback, but there's no market for him right now. None of these NFL teams see him as a guy that's going to be a star player like a Joe Burrow or a Justin Herbert, but they also don't see him as a bridge guy who could fill in for a year or two. And what I mean by a bridge guy, it's a guy you bring in like Marcus Mariota for the Falcons. The difference with Mariota and Mayfield is that Mariota has accepted he's out of his prime and he's not going to be a NFL stud. So whenever you become self-aware, that's when you can put your ego aside. And remember, Mariota, he was a top NFL pick, but he's came out and stated if the Falcons want to select a quarterback, he'll help him. That's why I think a lot of these teams are somewhat scared to bring in Baker. They know whenever you get him, I'm not going to say you're going to get that toxic environment, but he's not going to be happy if things don't go his way, and he's going to speak his mind. Whereas for Marcus Mariota, if he gets benched, he's not going to cry about it or say anything. Did the Browns do him wrong? Yeah, but business is business. It's cutthroat. That's how it goes. Anyways, I'm getting sidetracked here. Let's get back on topic with the draft. I'm going to go over some of the notable pickups in my opinion. At number 122, the Raiders picked up Zamir White, who's the running back from Georgia. One thing you need to know about him is that his nickname is Zeus. He's not a real explosive running back, like he's not a utility back. He's solely drafted to run the football. Why it's so interesting to me is because the Raiders have declined to take the fifth year option on Josh Jacobs, their other running back. Do I think White's going to come in and steal his job? No, but it's one thing to pay attention to. One thing I love about this kid coming out of college is that he is super consistent. In three years at Georgia, every single year he averaged right at five yards a carry. You see that and it doesn't really wow you or excite you, but what it does tell you and go watch the film, He's super consistent. He shows up each and every game and you know what you're getting. I think getting him in the fourth round, it's not really a steal, but it's where he should have gone. I think he can be a good running back in the NFL. Going down the list here, another interesting one is at number 137, the Patriots picked up Bailey Sapp, who was a quarterback. I'm going to assume maybe only... 20 or 30 percent of the people watching this have even heard of this kid if you're not a big college football fan you probably have no idea who he is i'm going to tell you right now i'm not so sure if he's going to be an nfl star or if he's a diamond in the rough but what he did last year on the college level it was utterly ridiculous this isn't in his career this was in one season in 2021 he passed for 5,967 yards, had 62 touchdowns to 11 interceptions. Yes, that's right. You heard me correctly. He nearly had 6,000 passing yards. You may be thinking, oh, well, he wasn't efficient doing it. And you'd be wrong because his completion percentage was 69%. I get it. I get it. I'm not even too high on him. He played at Western Kentucky and the competition is not all there. We have to come to a point in time where I don't care if you're playing D1, D2, D3, or high school football. If you throw for 6,000 yards and your completion percentage is nearly 70 and you have over 60 touchdowns, I don't think it's a fluke. I could be wrong about that. Maybe he just had one magical season. It's an interesting pick because number one, he was a star in college football, 
But number two, remember, the Patriots got Mac Jones last year. So if they got Mac Jones, why in the world would they draft another quarterback even if it is in the fourth round? According to the reports, the director of player personnel for the Patriots have said they're taking a college-like approach to feed the pipeline at the quarterback position. That makes a ton of sense, and if you don't know what that means, let me dumb it down. In other terms, the Patriots, they didn't draft Bailey Zapp because they're fearing that Matt Jones, he's going to be a bust and Bailey Zapp's going to come in and try to beat him out for the starting quarterback position. They drafted him because they're wanting to have not just one good quarterback on the roster, but they want to have two to three and continue to build a legacy just like college football. For example, at Alabama, you had Bryce Young coming in knowing he was going to sit behind Mac Jones. And then behind Bryce Young right now, you got two to three other four and five star recruits waiting. That's the approach that the Patriots are taking in the NFL. Is it smart? Is it going to work? I don't know. We've never seen an NFL team really do this. I can say, though, whenever they do draft these quarterbacks late in rounds like Jimmy Garoppolo, Tom Brady, and this one, it has worked out. I guess we shall wait and we shall see. Just keep your eyes on that one. I do think the Patriots have made it somewhat clear that Matt Jones, he's their guy. They made that clear when they kicked Cam Newton to the curb. But maybe if he's struggling next year, if he has a bad year, they could put this guy in and see what he got. Early on in the fifth round with the 144th overall pick, the Washington Commanders, is that the new name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Commanders, they picked up Sam Howell from North Carolina. He's a quarterback at one point in time in his college career. There was conversations that he could be a first rounder. One thing about Sam Howell and the reason he really fell that far is because he never really got better in college. And matter of fact, he took a step backwards last year. Going into the season, there was conversations that he could possibly win the Heisman, and if he had a good year, he could be a number one or number two overall pick. Here's what I'm talking about. In 2019, he had 3,600 passing yards with 38 touchdowns and seven interceptions, a completion percentage of 61. Really good. When you see that, you're like, dang. This guy's going to be a beast. That was only his first year. In his second year, 2020, it was even better. He jumped up his completion percentage to 68, threw for 3,600 yards again, and had 30 touchdowns with seven interceptions. The touchdowns did decrease, but the interceptions, they stayed the same. And with all the hype surrounding him in 2021, him and North Carolina, they had a bad year for their standards. His completion percentage dropped nearly 6% back down to 62.5. His passing yards dropped nearly 500 yards to barely cracking 3,000. His touchdowns went down and his interceptions went up. That's not a good sign. There is some times where the box score and those numbers, they can be somewhat deceiving, but those aren't. I watched him a ton last year and I can honestly say I never saw the hype in him. I was actually to the point where I was disappointed because of how good he was in his freshman and sophomore season. It didn't make sense to me how a player could be that dominant in his first two years and in his third year take a step backwards. The only thing I can assume is that maybe the pressure surrounding him, it was too much. After that, nothing too crazy happened. I do like how the Jacksonville Jaguars picked up the running back from Ole Miss, Snoop Connor. I like Snoop Connor. He didn't get a love and attention because of Matt Corral, but I think he could be a good NFL back. Not too much to talk about in the sixth and seventh round a bunch of no names got selected and what's so funny about it like i said early on in this video we're gonna point back to some random dude that got selected in this sixth round and say dang how did we not see his potential it happens all the time and mr irrelevant ironically wasn't even irrelevant if you watch college football it was a quarterback from ohio not ohio state iowa state brock purdy he had a shaky season in iowa state and He's the last pick. There's not too much to say. If he doesn't work out, who cares? On a serious note, how would you feel being selected with the last pick in the NFL draft? Would you be mad about it or would you be happy? I guess there's kind of mixed emotions and I don't want you to look at it from you being on your couch. Of course, you would be happy. I want you to look at it as if you were a football player working hard your entire life. There is that somewhat embarrassing factor when you tell people, oh yeah, I got selected in the draft and they ask you what pick and you're like, oh, uh, I was the last pick. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? There's that little embarrassing factor there. With all that being said, we got to get on to the main topic and the main player we're going to focus on in this video. 
Justin Ross. Justin Ross just so happens to be a player who's not too far from where I'm from, and I've kept up with him ever since high school. I know it's gonna sound ridiculous when I say it, but I mean it 100%. This dude's a beast. It sounds ridiculous for me to say that I get it 100%. A guy that got undrafted, how do I even have the right to say he's a quote-unquote beast? It doesn't make sense. If he was a beast, Matt, he would have got drafted, right? Well, you see, ladies and gentlemen, he had a lot of setbacks in his career. And this is why I don't understand the NCAA rules. How is it okay for these college basketball players to only play one year then declare for the draft, but in football you gotta play two? I don't like it and here's why. If you're good enough to go to the NFL and a team wants to draft you after one year playing college, who cares? You should be able to do that. What happened to free, not free speech, but just being able to do what you want. What I'm trying to say is, who are we to say and tell a player that he can't go to the NFL, but he's already good enough. What does one more year of going to college really do for that player? Nothing at all. Because these guys, come on now, they're not going to Alabama. They're not going to Clemson, Ohio State, USC for education. There's got to be a conspiracy theory about it. And I just really don't understand. I might take a look into it as to why they even have to play a second year. The only thing it brings is negatives, and this is a perfect situation and example. In Justin Ross's first season at Clemson, he embarrassed, and yeah, let me reemphasize that, he embarrassed Alabama in the championship game. I remember watching that game live, and what he was doing to our cornerbacks and defensive backs, it was just laughable. I, it literally got to the point where I couldn't help but laugh. We couldn't do nothing to stop that man, and he was only a freshman. After his freshman year, it was already being said he's going to be a first-round pick in the NFL draft. That's not me saying it. If you watch college football and you keep up with this dude, you know what I'm talking about. The hype surrounding him after that first year, especially doing what he did to a Nick Saban-led team, it was up there. In that first season, he had 46 catches for 1,000 yards with nine touchdowns. Fast forward in time to 2019, he comes back, has a solid year. 66 catches, 865 yards, and eight touchdowns. However, this is where his life would drastically turn and just tragic stuff unfolded. In 2020, going into spring practice, it was discovered that he had a rare condition in his spine it needed surgery to repair. At the time, there was a really good chance that he would never play football again. So for him to even come back and play, it was a miracle itself. He had to miss that entire junior season and it just set him back. You gotta think about it, that's a spine injury, that is something that's major. I know ACLs are bad, but it, I think a spine injury is worse than that. Without a spine, you can't even do anything. Back pain is nothing to mess around with. After missing that entire 2020 year, he comes back in 21, and he was okay. He had 46 catches for 500 yards and 3 touchdowns, but their quarterback, DJ Ua Ungole, he wasn't helping him out by any means. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, and I'm giving him the excuse. That was his first year back from a major life just trauma going on. Oh yeah, I almost forgot to mention this. He also had to miss the last three games of the season last year because of a foot injury. So overall, he's a banged up player going into the NFL draft, and that's not a good sign. He has a bad injury history, and it is concerning. I just got to be 100% honest. At Clemson's Pro Day, he wasn't nothing special. His 40 yard dash was only 468. His vertical jump was also only a measly 31.5 inches. I could sit up here and read off all those draft combine numbers from when he did the combine in Clemson, but I think you get the point. All of his numbers, they took a hit. And I truly and firmly believe it's because of that spine injury. On top of that, he's also dealing with a foot injury and some other minor stuff. There's a ton of concerns around him, and I understand it. If you don't understand why he went undrafted, I don't know what to tell you. Him going undrafted, it does make sense to me. I've said it before, that's why N'Kobe Dean and Matt Crow in yesterday's video, they fell so far. If you're hurt and you have medical issues, that is a big factor and you will fall. I said it in yesterday's video and it applies here. When you're going to buy a new car, you don't want to buy a car that you got to fix up and it's not already working. You want to buy a car that when you buy it that day, you can drive it home. And for Justin Ross, these teams aren't too sure if they can plug him in and he'll be efficient right away. Was he great in his freshman year at Clemson? Yeah, he was awesome, but that was nearly three to four years ago. I hate to say it, but it's the harsh truth. He's no longer that same player. Can he get there or get back there one day? Yeah, hopefully he can but he's not there. I'm gonna read off this tweet from Roger Sherman. He said, 
Here's why I will never, ever, ever get mad about NIL or pay for play. One, two, three years ago, everybody knew Justin Ross would be a first rounder. Now he's undrafted. Let them get as much money as they can, however they can, as soon as possible. If it changes college football, which is questionable, whatever. Most of y'all know how I feel about the NIL. I'm all about these players getting paid. Go get your money, man. My mind will never change on that because I don't think it's fair for all these universities to rake in millions and millions and millions of dollars and the players don't get a dime of it. I understand the universities, they fund it, but without the players, there's nothing. Without Trevor Lawrence at Clemson, you may not bring in as many fans. Without CJ Stroud at Ohio State, you may not bring in as many fans, and it also means you're not making as much money. I know some idiot's gonna say, well, Matt, they can get rid of CJ Stroud and plug in some other four or five star recruit. That's not the point. The point is, whenever these teams are successful and people are coming in, it's due to the players. And when all these stadiums sell out, at least prior to the NIL, the players weren't getting a dime of that money. I'll stand on it till the day I die. If somebody's willing to pay you for your craft, you should be able to get that money. I'm very curious. Let me know your thoughts on all this down below. But,